Okay, hi everyone. We're gonna start in a minute. I'm gonna let some people join and then we'll start. Okay, it looks like we have people joining now. So we'll get started. Um, welcome to the next live chat in our series, COVID-19 Essential Functions of the Environmental Health Workforce. My name is Audrey Keenan. I'm a project coordinator in the Program and Partnership Development Department at the National Environmental Health Association. And thank you so much for joining us today. The COVID-19 Essential Functions of the Environmental Health Workforce live chat series highlights the role of the environmental health workforce in reopening, recovery, and resilience of the environmental public health system during the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, the series explores the challenges posed by the pandemic on environmental health and plans to address these challenges going forward. Uh, before we get started with our webinar today, I just want to highlight some of NEHA's COVID-19 resources for you. Uh, first, please check out NEHA's COVID-19 resource website and our COVID-19 response online community that houses this live chat series and some other resources. NEHA.org also has a webpage that lists some resources on COVID-19, um, including a report on a rapid needs assessment that was conducted at the end of March. NEHA's position statement on COVID-19, our just-in-time video series, and other documents on a variety of EH topics. If you aren't already, we strongly encourage you to become a NEHA member because membership to our organization offers a lot of value. Um, and then just a couple more items before we get started. We are offering continuing education credits for attending today, and I'll be sharing the form and instructions for that afterwards, or you can feel free to reach out to me directly. I also wanted to let everyone know that we are recording this live chat, and I'll share the recording with everyone in an email afterwards. Um, now we can get started. The title of today's episode is Hotels, Conferences, and Environmental Health During COVID-19. Today's live chat is being sponsored by the NEHA Business and Industry Affiliate. And we're going to have plenty of time throughout the webinar and also at the end for questions. So please use the chat box to share any questions you have throughout our presentation. Um, today's session will be moderated by Dr. David Dijak, NEHA's Executive Director. So now I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Dijak, to introduce our speakers today. Yeah, uh, thanks, Audrey. And before we get started with the formal introductions, I wanted to let everyone know, starting in mid-March, I have envisioned this conversation uh, with this gentleman, uh, Michael Dominguez. What most of you don't know is many, many years ago, I spent four years in the hotel industry. Michael, I'm not sure you were, you were aware of that. I worked at the front desk of one of the most expensive hotels in Baltimore, Maryland. I went on to become the night auditor of that hotel back when we used an adding machine to reconcile the lounges and the front desk and all the other banquet charges that came in. And then I spent the better part of two years in corporate sales. Uh, what most people don't know about the hospitality industry, it's more than just how quickly you can get checked in. It's, it's really like a ballet, one that's carefully choreographed with the music and the performance and the acoustics all have to, having to be taken into account for. And when you think about uh, NEHA as an organization, we have between three to 4,000 room nights each year uh, that we uh, are accountable for with our annual conference and a variety of trainings that we provide throughout the United States and the territories. Most of our state affiliates have annual meetings that they hold in hotels. And so we're not just abstract of, uh, uh, ob observers of the hospitality industry. This touches each and every one of us throughout our professional career. And Michael, for many of the people that are on the line today, uh, they inspect your facilities, the facilities in the hospitality industry for food and beverage, uh, for pools and spas, and a variety of other aspects related to uh, the functioning of a, of a good hotel. So uh, the audience you're speaking to today 
is one that, frankly, uh, you have an intimate relationship with, whether you know it or not, all across the United States. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Michael Dominguez. He's president and CEO of Associated Luxury Hotels International. Michael serves as the president and chief executive officer of uh, this group. And uh, he is uh, ALHI, the Associated Luxury Hotels International, is a global sales organization with a team of 80 professionals located among 26 offices in North America and Europe. Uh, ALHI's uh, professionals, or I'm sorry, serves a membership group of hotels that are independent hotels and independent brands that are an exclusive luxury collection. Prior to joining a ALHI, Michael served in executive sales leadership roles at the MGM Resorts, Lowe's Hotels, Hyatt Hotels, Starwoods, and in addition to many others. Michael is actively involved in leadership roles in the meetings and events industry, and currently serves as the past chairman of the International Board of Directors for MPI. Michael speaks in the industry often on topics of disruption and the state of the industry, the economy, and behavioral lessons. Michael was recognized in uh, MNC Magazine survey as one of the top speakers and was invited speaker at South by Southwest in 2018. Uh, I could go on and on. Michael has many leadership roles with board positions, including ASAE and GBTA, uh, among others. And he has numerous honors related to the hospitality industry. Uh, when I was searching for someone who might speak out on what's happening within the hospitality industry, uh, someone whisper, whispered in my ear, if you could only get Michael Dominguez to talk, because when he speaks, he's an influencer, he's a rainmaker, and people pay attention uh, to his thought leadership. And so with that, Michael, I, I really appreciate you being with us this afternoon. Uh, we're hoping your colleague, Peter Shala, uh, can join us as well. Uh, Peter Shala is president and chief uh, operating officer of Delos. And uh, uh, Peter has a very interesting background, which we'll share once he can join us uh, on the call this afternoon. Uh, but, but Michael, I, I've got to open this up and I hope I did uh, some type of justice to all of the things that you've accomplished and are currently accomplishing in the hospitality industry. But wow, what is going on in hotels? We're now in the midst of the summer season. Fourth of July is coming up. Uh, the public wants to travel. Business wants to get back to business as usual. Uh, you and I spoke last week and you mentioned that some hotels are at 100% capacity. Sir, uh, what is going on? Would you give us a high level overview from your perspective? And remember, your audience are environmental health professionals. Uh, these are people that are interested in the environment, health and safety of your employees, as well as the traveling public, sir. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that. I, um, I always joke, when you read all those things I've done in the industry, it just means I'm not home and that uh, <laughs> my, my wife can attest to that. Um, but I, I, I'm passionate about this industry. I, I think the industry as a whole plays an important function in a variety of ways. Um, you know, when you gather and you meet, even the people you bring together, um, it, it's, an, it's an interesting one that when you bring people together, we're, we're, we always say, when we meet, we change the world. Um, the best medical advances, the advances in society, they come together through these meetings and events and conferences. And I think travel is, you know, high level of I can be a little bit, um, a little bit, uh, I guess Pollyanna in nature, you know, when I look at travel as a whole, I think it's the best educator we have of learning about cultural, uh, cultural um, backgrounds and understanding and, um, you know, high level that those things have to come back. I think it's in our DNA uh, to engage and connect and to travel. Uh, we, we've tended to do that. Every major demand shock we've ever seen whether it was 2001, whether it was a great recession, whether it was SARS, uh, we've always back, bounced back stronger as an industry just from travel. And that tells me it, there's an innate need in human beings to travel, to explore, and to be together. We have unique challenges now. And when you talk about this group, um, getting people to be back in our buildings, getting people to be able to travel and do that in a safe way is candidly the challenge of our lifetime. And uh, I don't think I'm overstating that when I say that, you know, none of us have experienced anything uh, at this level. Um, and and we, we right now, I think the biggest struggle as we come back, you are correct, 
hotels that are opening up, they're, they're selling out. Um, they are following protocols. And I just got off a call uh, a little bit ago and the planners are like, you know, what should we be thinking of? What everybody has told you, wear your mask, wash your hands and keep your distance. And if we can all do that, we can do some of the things that we, we used to do, but in a little bit of a different way. And, and, and I state that because we're not trying to get back to normal. Uh, the end of 2020 is gonna look different. There's some normalcy into some of the things we've done. Uh, and, and I can personally uh, talk to this. I, I've traveled the last three weeks in a row. Uh, I'll be jumping on a plane this afternoon for my fourth trip. And I'm doing it, one, because I believe that you can travel and do it safely. And two, I'm doing it to show and document for our industry, what that experience looks like. Uh, I find some of the fear is coming from what are people really doing? What does that look like? And uh, I would take it past the hotels. I think the hotels, there's a, there's a certain level. And as you said, uh, we, we have an intimate relationship with this group already. So this group will know there's a really good level of cleanliness and protocol that goes in on hotels to begin with. We have this added layer now that we have to focus on that has to do with the virus itself and reducing transmission. And some of the protocols not about cleaning, it's about the protocols are about distancing and transmission barriers and how we adhere to that. But what we're finding with the public, they have to get there. So it's the entire journey that they're even more nervous about than anchoring at a hotel and knowing at a hotel, I can have that kind of experience. I've got to get to the airport. I then have to be getting through through the airport. Then I have to get on a plane. Then I have to get off a plane and then I have to get into another vehicle. There's five different points that you have to think about along that journey. And that's as an industry, what we're trying to build some confidence around. And, and you know, I can tell you there's uh, certain areas doing it really well. Delta Airlines, uh, you know, and I'm not saying this because they're our strategic partner. I, I, I became a fan of them long before I became a, a uh, president of Alhai. Uh, I, I've been a diamond, you know, a diamond traveler with Delta for a long period of time. They do it right. And what I found here is from the moment they started coming back here, their CEO committed to 60% load factors from the beginning. Uh, they were the ones using fogging machines uh, on their international trips before everybody else started to do this. But now they're doing it on every domestic flight to make sure that they are sanitizing the cabin. But the airlines are doing a pretty good job of saying, this is what we're doing. I know Southwest is leaving every middle seat open. I've traveled on a couple of airlines where they packed the planes. Well, the problem is when that becomes social media clickbait and everybody starts to see that, then all of a sudden you lose the confidence of a general public saying, um, or, or starting to tune out the messaging that we are creating a safer environment for you to travel. Um, those are the biggest struggles we're looking at right now, but we do see meetings coming back. I can tell you, I have a hotel that has a 200 person meeting coming up in two weeks, a 700 person meeting coming up in four weeks. Um, and the CDC, and this should give everybody comfort, they just issued guidance last week for um, guidelines for events and mass gatherings. Well, they wouldn't be issuing guidelines except that they would allow events and mass gatherings or they know that they're gonna happen. Um, the challenge we're having right now is it varies state by state on what is allowed, what does that look like, what can the experience look like, and that's probably the biggest struggle for people right now that are planning meetings is they don't know exactly what the, the ground rules are depending on where they're going to be. And uh, that's probably as high arching as I could give you an overview of what's going on. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the 60% load factor uh, after I started the conversation by saying some hotels are at 100%. Now, hotels and airlines are two different things, and I, and I understand that. But getting back to the locality issue, uh, we like to say environmental health is profoundly local. How are your constituents approaching this uh, highly complex country in which local regulations, local statutes, or local practices are being played out quite differently all across the United States. If you're running a hotel chain or you have multiple properties in different jurisdictions, what is the strategic approach that the industry is taking to ensure uh, some baseline of health and safety within those properties? Well, th th there is a baseline and, you know, I, I co-chair, um, I, I co-chair a task force for our industry, which is a part of APEX, 
uh, part of the Event Industry Council. Apex is the Accepted Practices Exchange. And we are a large group uh, representing all sectors of the industry. Uh, Peter is on that, uh, on that group with us as well. And, and what we are doing right now is trying to get through the clutter, trying to get, uh, become a single source for people to know this is where you go to get those answers uh, because it's, it's a little cumbersome right now. And, and that what we're trying to do right now is know that specifically, let's talk about hotel protocols. Hotel protocols, there is a baseline and everybody has that baseline and then there's nuance uh, state by state. And, and what I mean by the baseline is the American Hotel Lodging Association actually uh, came out with a safe state program that all of the hotels are adhering to and that's the baseline. It is doing what we need to do um, in regards to the clean, cleaning protocols uh, are revolving around this issue. Now. There's nuance, as you just said, because you may have a state, for instance, in California, where they are now requiring masks um, anywhere you go in public. Well, that, that is a different guideline than in other areas where in certain cities or certain counties, a mask may be required, but not through the entire state. All we are doing right now is understanding we're creating clean environments, and then we are trying to identify the protocols as they change from city to state because there is gonna be some nuance to it, but you should be, you, people should be comfortable enough to know that there is a baseline. And that baseline is creating a clean environment. Uh, and and, and I, I'm always careful. It is impossible for us to create a safe environment. We are creating safer environments. We are reducing risk. Um, and probably one of the biggest issues we're having right now, doctor, is that we were, we've been talking about, we need a code of conduct for travelers to understand, you have a responsibility in this too. Because I, I can create the greatest environment around in a, in a less risky environment, but if you refuse to practice social distancing, if you refuse to wear your mask when you're being asked to, if you refuse to wash your hands uh, consistently when you are on property, it's all for naught. Um, I, I can create an environment, but people have to follow the rules as well. And, and I think that's one of the bigger rubs we're seeing right now is that even where you have rules in place, uh, we, we live in such a free society. It's hard to tell people you're mandating. And in this case, in certain cases, we have to uh, for their own good because they may not be listening. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the shared responsibility is an important message. I live on the border between Virginia and Maryland. Uh, Maryland has a 100% face covering rule. Virginia does not. And so when you go inside facilities, it's almost like being in two different universes, although I can be uh, in Virginia in about 10 minutes from my Maryland home. So it's uh, uh, just as a pedestrian, I see some of these, uh, the contrasting practices. And I imagine if you, if you are operating facilities in multiple states, that's gotta be challenging. I, I know that uh, Peter uh, Shala was having some technical difficulties. Uh, Peter, were you able to join us? There he is. He just popped on. Okay, just in time. Sorry about yeah. that. I was uh, Pete, I heard everything you said, uh, but uh, for some reason I had to re-log re in. All right. Well, Peter, I'm glad you could join us. Uh, Peter is president and COO of, of uh, Delos. And uh, Peter, we're glad that you could join us. You have a fascinating background in U.S. equity derivatives training, trading, I should say. Uh, you were a partner at Goldman Sachs. Uh, seems like you've spent a lot of time in New York. And uh, you have a degree from New York University uh, with a background in finance and international business. What are you doing on the phone right now with that kind of, uh, with that kind of background? And I understand that you've been very focused on CDC and WHO guidelines as it relates to hotel operations. You're speaking to environmental health and public health professionals. So tell us, why are you on the call? And what are you doing around CDC and WHO suggestions and recommendations uh, for a safe and healthy traveling public? Excellent, thank you, and uh, thank you for that background. Yeah, uh, big switch from uh, the early part of my career. Um, in and around 2012, um, uh, I made an observation actually with my twin brother, Paul, um, about uh, real estate and sustainability. Uh, and the observation was back then in 2012, the entire focus on the sustainability movement as it related to built structures uh, pertained to the environment um, and uh, energy usage. Uh, and what we, 
What we observed was that there was a real vacuum in thought as it related to the effect that buildings have, not just on the environment, uh, but on the people inside these spaces. And so uh, we started a journey uh, and actually spent about three years doing nothing but research, um, brought in some uh, leading, uh, leading minds and in institutions such as the Mayo Clinic, uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, doctors from Harvard Sleep School and Columbia Medical. And it was very interesting because what we observed at that point when we posed the question, what can we do inside four walls and a roof to actually work passively on the human body and address the health of not just the environment with green building and lead certification and whatnot, but on the human uh, sustainability side of the equation. Um, and and it, it felt like, and certainly seemed like it was the first time that doctors and architects were having professional dialogue. Uh, which was quite interesting at that point. Um, you know, we, we advanced that body of work uh, and ultimately uh, formed a company called the International Wellbuilding Institute, which is a for-benefit uh, for corporation uh, that uh, released the Wellbuilding Standard uh, in 2015, uh, which is uh, a parallel track to green building and lead certification, uh, but really focused on the things that happen indoors uh, and how those uh, four walls and a roof that we're spending over 90% of our time in uh, affect human health, productivity, and so on and so forth. Um, there's been some great adoption of the well building standard and the well ecosystem. Uh, and then, uh, you know, boom, uh, the, the pandemic hits. And of course, uh, the uh, types of interventions that you can do passively indoors to you know, recognize the correlation between things like uh, temperature and heart rate variability, to recognize that particulate matters do have effect on our cognition, uh, to recognize that sleep and circadian lighting patterns really do affect our uh, susceptibility to things like jet lag, of course, our sleep quality, uh, and then uh, equally, you know, susceptibility to long-term disease. And so this body of work that really married the health sciences and the building sciences and manifested in uh, the well certification program uh, has become uh, a lot more relevant uh, overnight. Uh, at the outset of the pandemic in March, uh, we at the International Well Building Institute established a, uh, a global task force um, that was over 550 virologists, scientists, and building experts at the end of the day uh, to define what the International Well Building Institute's response would be to COVID, to make sure that advancements were being made, uh, especially as it relates to pathogen transmission risk indoors. Uh, and, uh, you know, thankfully through that process and, and some great thought leadership uh, have decided to help fill a void in the marketplace right now where we see industry groups, industry practitioners, uh, building owners and operators doing a wonderful job responding and listening to um, guidelines from CDC and WHO. Um, and what we felt that the International Well Building Institute could do to help fill a void in the marketplace is provide third party documentation review of the practices, protocols, policies related to operations, cleaning and maintenance, of course, emergency response, um, access to, uh, to, to health and wellness services and whatnot. Uh, in order to help try, try to inspire confidence from stakeholders and guests of buildings, whether it's a guest in a hotel um, or other structures, that not only have policies and protocols been put in place in response to pathogen concerns, uh, but that these policies and protocols have been mapped correctly to science. Uh, one of the things you can't do, I guess, you know, with an organization like the CDC is say, Center for Disease Control, thank you for the guidelines. This is how we've adjusted our policies and how we're operating a building or a built facility and maintaining that facility. Um, can you provide some sort of review of the documentation and the policies to make sure we got it right? Um, and, and, and then in exchange, you know, provide a designation. Um, it, it's not the role of the CDC. Um, so we took the CDC guidelines, the WHO guidelines, NIH, of course, the findings from the IWBI task force, uh, and established a process whereby we can provide third-party validation of the great work that's being done. We've been very impressed with what the industry groups have been doing. Um, and thankfully, the IWBI as an organization has been able to administer well certification, so certification of healthy buildings uh, in over 60 countries and about 5,000 projects since that period of time of 2015. Uh, and we felt that uh, there was a role that we could play with integrity there that was not duplicative to what the industry had been doing. Lots of folks and brands and, and, and stakeholders have put out their guidelines and policies 
uh, we're here to provide um, the scientific evidence that they've been mapped correctly to, uh, to those guidelines. Yeah, th thank you. So in that case, uh, let's say we have somebody from Seattle King County on the phone and their job is to inspect a hotel. They show up next week. Uh, would they ask the general manager for evidence that they comply with this third party uh, verification process? What, what exactly does that look like at the ground level? Yeah, excellent. Uh, th there's there's really two two grades of certification of a built facility, right? You know, there's of course um, a re review of the intent, a review of the policies, and what adjustments have been made internally on how the facility is run. Number one, number two, the on-site performance verification that these things are actually being enacted and implemented. Uh, and when we thought about you know the well building standard in general, we said, look. You know, looking at what LEED certification did, it's, it's a wonderful process because people can make promises as it relates to their carbon footprint. They can make promises as it relates to their energy usage in, in the way a building is designed. Uh, that being said, you know, how can we provide commissioning that, that, that does support the notion that a LEED platinum building actually is not using a lot of energy? Right. And so when we structured the well building standard, we said we need to include this element of performance verification so that if we're prescribing categories of air purification, water purification, acoustics and how, you know, ambient sound levels affect bodies, stress levels and whatnot. Let's make sure that that includes an on site performance verification where these things are tested. So, you know, the parallel would be like a, a doctor putting a stethoscope on the building to test the air. Sure. Test the water so on and so forth. Now with COVID and the response to COVID, this health safety rating um, is a part of the solution, okay? But as Michael said before, and, I, and I, I did hear you since the beginning of the call, there is no one, you know, end all be, be all approach. We've got to attack this in many, many different angles here. Um, so the, the health safety designation was intended to say, okay, well, let's play this following role. And then of course we can do on-site inspection on broader wellness categories. But let's take a look at what you've done as it relates to emergency response, access to equipment, um, you know, of course, the, the cleaning and maintenance protocols, uh, the, the HR policies as it relates to staff and staff training. You know, there's such a rich body of knowledge and people need to digest that knowledge so that they can become good actors in this equation. You can do whatever you want to a building, but if the people inside are not doing the right thing, um, then it becomes obviously much less effective and much more risky. Uh, so this is a, a way to look at what has been done policy-wise, make sure that every category is covered, that it is following the right science at its root and at its core, um, and then you know reward uh, organizations that have done that. The following step, of course, would be on-site and are these things being implemented? And you know, is somebody that was trained properly um, at the front desk doing the things that they're supposed to? Um, so I do reiterate that point, that this has got to be something that is tackled from many, many, many different angles. There's many different roles to play in this ecosystem, uh, and we need to be clear about what we are providing and what we're not. Yeah, so I like your ecosystem metaphor, and the ecosystem is changing in a Darwinian way really quickly. That is, what we knew last week may not be true this week. Uh, I personally have tried to write guidance documents and gave up, because as fast as I would type it, something new would come up. Exactly. And so it's in this dynamic, uh, explosive environment where we have Florida and California and Texas, you know, gargantuan states with huge economies uh, that frankly are having a resurgence of cases. Uh, this is creating a lot of anxiety, a lot of emotional response uh, to an industry that I think most people don't understand just from business travel is a half a trillion dollars. Yeah. This is an important part of the U.S. economy. I, I understand there's close to 8 million people employed in this, uh, in this work. And so what I heard you say is uh, the upstream indicator might be this, this third party uh, certification uh, that you can use that as a leading indicator that perhaps the uh, hotel properties are paying close attention uh, to this issue. But then when you drill down to the local level, how, how are our hotel management uh, approaching the health and safety of their employees. Uh, we hear about essential workers at grocery stores and the like. Uh, you have to have employees to run a, a well-run uh, hotel. Uh, how have things changed as it relates to people that show up every day and uh, run those banquets and run the front desk and make sure that the rooms are cleaned? Uh, what, what, what is the approach that the industry is using at this time? 
I, I can take that one. I can tell you, and I've seen it firsthand. Um, it, to Peter's point, uh, the amount of training that's going on and retraining uh, for the employees to understand what they have to do moving forward, uh, probably not a surprise. Everybody is being tested as they come back to work. Um, those tests are frequent, but again, nuance in that. Uh, you'll see some places there, they may be testing daily. There'll be other places that may be testing weekly. Um, but there, there is a, some, there is an initial form of testing when they first come back on board, no matter what. Um, but in addition to that, you're getting into mask. Uh, that has been a non-option for any of the hotels that have opened. Uh, all employees are wearing masks. Uh, the cleaning and protocols have changed dramatically. You're going to see transmission barriers where you never saw them before. Um, you will not go to a front desk that's wide open today. And, and again, as I've mentioned, I've traveled the last three weeks and every hotel I've gone to, that is very consistent. Um, transmission barriers everywhere you go, even in a restaurant, the hostess uh, stand now has transmission barriers uh, to protect the employees. Uh, what I found fascinating, one of the hotels I was at last week, and it was in Mexico actually, um, the, the managing director took me back to the house, but the signage we you see in front to remind our guests what to do it is that on steroids in the back of the house. Um, and I mean that sincerely because we still want the hotel to be pretty. So when we're reminding you about six feet of separation, you may see a circle with the feet reminding you to keep uh, six feet distance. And, and you may see those sporadically through the hotel or in an elevator bank. Back of the house, I was seeing those every three feet. Every three feet, they're everywhere to remind everybody, please keep your distance. The signage has changed where we used to remind everybody, make sure we smile and greet and approach the guests. It's all now about safety in back of the house. And, and what's good about that though, you've switched out where employees were used to going. Uh, they always went to those same boards for the information. They always had the same reminders. So it's where their eyes are accustomed to going already. Uh, in the employee dining room, I saw a dramatic shift. And it's, it's not even what you're seeing in the front of house. It's how we operate our back of the house, which is a hotel in itself. And, you know, you go to the employee dining room and every employee dining room probably has one thing consistent. You always have salad, you have fruit. It's usually a self-serve buffet. You're seeing today, it's a service buffet. And instead of laying out all these salads or, or this big tub of salad and this big tub of chopped fruit, you're seeing individual portions already prepared. So they can take it and, and go with them. So it's a process from start to finish, um, but it is something that is being taken, and I have to stress that, taken very seriously because um, at the end of the day, the hotels care most about their the health of their team members. And you wanna make sure they keep them healthy. And it's not just them infecting a guest, it is making sure they don't affect each other and they don't become infected from people that are traveling with us. But those protocols are pretty deep and it's the employee side of it of getting them surprisingly, um, well, it was probably surprisingly to me, it wasn't hard to get the employees to follow the new protocols. Um, they're worried about their safety too mm -hmm. and they wanna work in a safe environment. So it's not as difficult as you would think because they want to be safe and they've always thought about the safety of the guests coming through the door. So they are taking the protocols very seriously in that regard. Yeah, thanks. Can, can you unpack food and beverage? And I would guess uh, for the people on the phone, this is where they're going to be hyper focused. Uh, my favorite self serve buffet, you know, I go to the Hilton. Uh, I'm not a Delta flyer, but I stay at Hilton. If there's anyone from Hilton on the line, thank you. Uh, the self serve buffet that's offered to the people who stay frequently uh, is something that I always valued. Uh, but I picked up a tongs that somebody in front of me picked up. Uh, that somebody else in front of them had picked up. So how is the industry approaching uh, what had traditionally been a self-serve environment and for many of these properties? Well, it, it, the self-serve environment has gone for the short term, at least. Um, what you will see is we, we've even seen them in banquets that are running with some events currently um, where you have um, very sophisticated transmission barriers uh, for a banquet setting or that type of buffet. And in addition to that, you're now servicing it. it it's, it's, that's the complication or not, not that complicated. We've just reversed the process. You're not going to be serving yourself. Uh, it'll be served to you. And, uh, and then in some cases, buffets are going away and you're, you're not going to have them. R really, Michael? So during a coffee break, uh, 
no one will be touching the coffee urn? Nope, I, I can tell you already, uh, I've seen it live. The new coffee station, think of the, and I, 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 I um, first time we mentioned this, we had a planner say, well, that's really gonna slow down the process. And I said, how? You could only pour one cup of coffee at a time to begin with. Hmm. So it, it, it actually speeds it up if you think about it, because unlike a Starbucks, we are only serving coffee, decaf, and hot water, so you can make your tea. So what you're seeing is we've changed it. You'll have multiple stations, but you will come out and you'll basically come up and you're gonna either order coffee, decaf, or tea, and you will be handed that by somebody serving. And when people think that slows it down, anyone who's ever traveled through an airport and if you've ever eaten poorly, uh, and I do it sometimes when I'm running through and I'm picking up McDonald's, for instance, just going through, they, they stack Coke, Diet Coke, Sprite, because they know those are gonna be the orders. So during a rush hour, that you have somebody just replenishing that. It's going to be the same thing. If I know you're breaking at 1030, I, I'm already going to have lined up coffee and decaf that I just poured as you're breaking. And I'm going to have somebody behind me. If I'm the server, I'm going to have somebody behind me that's just replenishing my coffees and decafs as I start to give them out. Uh, but yeah, it, it's very, very insistent that you're not going to be at a coffee break. And it's not about you touching at a coffee break. You know what it is? It's hard for me to keep density control at a coffee break. It's hard for me to keep your distancing if you're lining up to get coffee that way. Not that hard if you're keeping six feet coming up and getting your coffee and I could have multiple lines going to be able to distribute coffee that way. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if Peter, if you wanted to share anything else on that. No, Mike, I, I, you've covered it, but what I, what I uh, am learning, uh, and I know that you've, you've got so much knowledge in the hospitality industry, but uh, the fact that you're traveling already uh, and that you're traveling uh, to these spaces uh, to see them live, I, I am super curious and I have not been on the road and I haven't traveled and I've heard some stories, but uh, it sounds like you're getting a, a pretty good glimpse, uh, in, even internationally at some of the things that are happening uh, on the ground. Uh, yeah. so, so that's, that's a great perspective. And Peter, well, I, I, I think where there's great need and I don't know how we get there. Like when I was in Mexico, their guidance is for one and a half meters on social distancing. Yeah. So what we're finding is a large variation. You probably saw the UK just announced for their pubs one meter right. uh, so that their pubs can open. That is where we're finding more and more confusion. Yeah. Um, when I travel around the globe and it's making it more confusing for our planners because most of them are international in thought process or in business, you know. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because the, the, the debates uh, and, and there will continue to be variability around one meter versus one and a half or two and so on and so forth, uh, because it really, the science tells us it varies by typology and setting. Uh, if you can imagine in a stadium setting with crowds roaring and cheering, um, the opportunity for uh, viral particles to travel uh, and to be emitted uh, at a rock concert, for example, much different than in a laboratory setting or in a, an office setting. So, so it really, there is no one right answer. It will continue to move. But some of the variability, um, you know, the, the issue with that is you, you can't harmonize one number for even one country versus another. Because depending on the setting you're in and how loud people are talking, whether they're shouting, um, how frequently they're talking, that sort of thing is, is you know, that really comes into play. Okay, so let's, let's make this real, gentlemen. Uh, I, I stay in a lot of hotels or did prior to, to March the 15th. Uh, I go to some hotels where people are having a sales seminar and it's pretty energetic. Uh, if I could say that politically correct, are, are hotels counseling people who are booking spaces saying perhaps that is not uh, a public health measure? Uh, that we we will abide by that you need to tone it down no yelling screaming singing or is that every man on his own i i can tell you right now and um i, I started this by talking about a group that peter are, and i uh both are participating in as far as the apex covid Re recovery task force um w w that part of that code of conduct is exactly what we're talking about and what you're going to see from the industry here within the next seven to 10 days coming out of that work stream. Um, the idea here is to not only get the code of conduct out, get, get organizations such as yours, get organizations to say, not only do I agree for, uh, with it, but we support it. You know, we, we're gonna get people to support, here's the code of conduct is saying there is a responsibility on your end. And, and understanding that a meeting between now and the end of the year specifically will not necessarily look like it looked before. 
Um, and, and it's really understanding that there, there are going to be some different requirements. Um, we, we've, we have found that probably the biggest gap is communication. You're going to have to communicate expectations prior to people coming, and, and it's really good at registration time. Uh, when people are registering for a conference or signing up, that they understand here's, here are the expectations if you're going to come that this is what the environment needs to look like so that we can create an environment uh, that again has reduced risk to try to keep people safe. All right, uh, thank you. I'd like to direct a question to Peter. Uh, I'm an industrial hygienist, Peter, and the uh, hierarchy of controls are of interest to me. And uh, what I know is uh, getting back to the beginning about the shared responsibility, engineering controls are the type that we like to implement because it takes the personal decision making out of the equation and so that buildings are engineered to be safe. Uh, we heard from the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine a couple days ago that uh, public spaces should be using single pass ventilation, that is the air comes in, it's passed through a crowd and then is uh, discharged outside. I do need to get a little bit graphic and I hope that's okay with you. We also know when you flush a toilet, aerosols can be released and uh, in many hotels, they don't have lids on the toilets. I'm not saying all, uh, but for the public toilets, uh, th there are no lids. Has the industry begun to struggle with these things? I mean, these are expensive fixes. Uh, and these are, of course, our, our risk factors. Uh, we certainly would like to see air not being recirculated, particularly in lead buildings, <laughs> which are energy efficient by design. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but uh, these are complicated, expensive issues. Uh, how are you guys approaching that and trying to stay in business? Yeah, they are. And, and, and thank you for raising that because, you know, there's, there's a lot of things you can do in the behavioral science category um, and, and encouraging the right uh, behavior, how we meet, how we gather, how we act in these spaces that we gather. Um, and then there's the physical element of the building. Um, and, and look, we, what we know is that uh, the, the built environment um, will likely continue to be the largest carrier of, of pathogens and viruses, whether that's on surface or whether that's airborne. Um, the, uh, the, the examples that you highlighted, they are expensive. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, in many cases, they are necessary, right? And so if you think about even touchless entry, you know, it's not cost effective or very cheap to take a door that swings open that thousand people are touching every day and swap that with something that opens electronically. Um, but what you're seeing is that's happening and that's happening across the board because I don't think people you know, have comfort right now and probably won't um, for a very long time, if ever, right? Returning to a world where they're sharing a doorknob or a door handle that swings open with people coming into spaces every you know, 15 seconds in some cases. Um, and so that's an expensive lift, there's no doubt. Air purification, air ventilation, those are expensive lifts. Uh, the industry in general is already somewhat on their knees as it relates to cash flow and operational revenue and excess capex to do this. So it really is two problems converging at the same time, the economic issue, but then the fact that some things that are required to really do this right and future proof spaces in this regard, um, they are expensive changes. This can't all be accomplished just by habits. Uh, that being said, there is a lot that can be done. And Michael, I know you started this way as well. There is a lot that can be done by following rules. Um, you know, if, if, if we think about what can be accomplished on the behavioral side, and if that can be done well, then that does take some of the burden away. Uh, for instance, if you can't uh, replace a door with an electronic door that opens, then let's make sure that we are encouraging, promoting, making it super, super easy that as soon as you've touched that surface, you have access to hand sanitization immediately, right? So there's there's workarounds and it does follow the same logic and the same science, but to answer your question directly, yes, these things are expensive uh, and, and that will be a burden for, for, for the industry for, for time to come. Okay, well, uh, this is something we'd love an update on in months into the future, because I think this is the new normal, but uh, I, I also have to ask a, a tough one and it's really interesting. Uh, when I travel with my spouse, we go into a hotel room and the very first thing uh, my spouse does is, is pull down the bedspread and anything uh, the upholstery, <laughs> any fabrics that may be uh, accessible to the prior occupant are, are you know, carefully folded and, and put into the closet. How, how are hotels practically disinfecting 
between occupants. Do either one of you have insight on that and uh, uh, any thoughts that you want to share that might imbue the traveling public with some confidence? Yeah, I, I can tell you that a majority of hotels have gone into um, the static foggers that are hitting the entire room. So to your point, it should it should bring you some comfort, but even, and I, I just know this in part of our, our um, portfolio, what is nice is many of the hotels are actually having it, um, there's an actual seal on your door that you break with your key, which will yeah. tell you nobody has gone in, not even staff has gone in after that room has been sanitized and cleaned. And uh, that would that should bring comfort to, um, to your wife in that regard. My wife's the same way, by the way. Um, and even if there's a seal and I tell her they're sanitized, I still think she's gonna pull down some of that stuff and put it away because it's her head. But I can tell you that the cleaning process and trying to give you a, vi a visible warning that nobody else has been in there, uh, that process is now in play. And, and, and it's more for your comfort so that you know mentally, okay, nobody else has been in my room. That's why the seal is there. And you're going to break it when you go in. And then at that point, uh, probably the biggest challenge today or change is, you know, in many of your luxury properties specifically, you, you may have had turndown service or twice a day service. Right. Um, that is actually up to your preference now. And you're finding hotels asking, would you like us to come and refresh your room or do you not want us in it? And, and it's even to the point that you can have a request to say, I'm not going to change your sheets and I'm not going to change your towels. I will come and bring new linens for you uh, for the bathroom and take away old linens, but we won't be in your room if that's your comfort level. What's interesting is many of the hotels started with a very strict process. Of nobody's going to go in the room. And I'll tell you, hotels had removed irons and ironing boards and hair dryers. And after the first few weeks, well, they had them on request. They took them out of the room to, as just part of the room. And what they found is 90% of the people coming in were saying, will you bring me my hair dryer? Will you bring me my iron and my ironing board? They wanted them back in the room. Um, so there's been a thought process, but I can tell you the one thing that has gone from the room. And to me, this is a great, um, a, a great uh, unattended consequence of everything going through. We've lost a lot of paper in the room. What used to be printed menus, we're now using QR codes for money. Everything we wanted to digitize for a long period of time and either didn't spend the money or take the time as a hotel industry, we're now doing. And we're forced to do it. And, and I think that's a silver lining. It's good for the environment. Uh, it's good long term. And it's really not necessary. It's forcing people there. You know what the biggest challenge is? You're forcing people into a digital world that don't necessarily always want to be there and they're your guests. Uh, in other words, you have people say, I still want to print and many. And we're like, well, we don't have them. So you're going to have to learn how to look at the, and we'll teach you. Look, I'll show you how to use the QR code. We'll show you how to do it. Um, if there's any silver lining, it's that. But you're, we're digitizing a lot. And, th and then I've had the question, well, Mike, does that mean all of our costs are going to go up in hotels uh, because you guys are doing this with locks and you're doing this with, you know, a lot of digital assets? I remind everybody, we have capital budgets and then we also have operational budgets. What's these type of investments are coming out of our capital budgets. That's a different budget line. And, and what I mean by that is the lobby we were gonna refresh may not get refreshed. But by the way, we've changed all the keys and locks in, in our hotel to make sure you can do that in a digital fashion. So th there's a little bit of that going on and, and a lack of understanding. Uh, th this isn't gonna relate necessarily to prices being jacked up because it is literally revolving around a capital expenditure versus uh, operational. Okay, uh, th thank you. Can you give me a 30, literally a 30 second description of what a digital fogger is? Oh, not a digital fogger. Uh, it's electric static fogger. Electrostatic, yeah, okay. So, so same thing used in hospitals. Uh, Delta's been using them for some time. Uh, it's based, the, the electrostatic's just the, uh, the mechanism, but basically it's, it's our ability to, um, to sanitize a room through a fog or a mist or a chemical system. And Peter might know the science behind it a little bit more, but that in essence, it's, it's the way we're cleaning the room through a fogging system that isn't harmful to you. Yeah, uh, um, and that, that's exactly right, Michael. The, the electrostatic sprayer is the mechanism of delivery um, so that it creates a mist. Um, and then there's two dimensions. Uh, one dimension is, you know, you clean something 
and then if somebody comes into the room and, and sneezes on a surface, it's contaminated again, and you have to continue to clean because it's really the intervals in between cleaning that are most dangerous, including in hospital settings. Uh, and then the other dimension, which is making a lot of progress, um, is uh, the electrostatic sprayers that uh, you know put a mist that actually fastens to the substrate and it fastens to the surface. Um, and if I could give you maybe 20 seconds on the science behind that, if you would imagine, um, and, and I'll, I'll put this in general terms, imagine little stones, little crystals, crushed up into billions of pieces, okay, and then suspended in water. So that in that mist, sprayed on a surface, becomes a real thin coating, odorless, uh, it doesn't wipe off, durable, right, because this is what you want to do, have to avoid coming in there all the time and cleaning. And on the surface is a thin coating, and those little crystals on the surface, when light reacts in the room to a crystal, what happens is there's a reflection, pops up an electron, and an electron is just sitting there dancing on the surface. When moisture in the air comes in contact with the surface and the electron, boom, the water molecule splits. Water molecules splitting, it's kind of similar to what hydrogen peroxide is, right? It's oxidation, it's energy. That energy can pen penetrate a molecule, a virus membrane, and actually kill the virus. So you can have a surface that is constantly cleaning every time the lights are on. And of course, depending on durability, how often does that need to be spread? That's the direction the industry is going. You know, innovation is at, at its highest in times of crisis, and we're starting to see these things. Now, of course, you've got to mind that versus the traps of, is it harmful? What are the consequences? What are the EPA regulations? And so on and so forth. So I have a high degree of confidence in science and technology. I think that this innovation um, is going to do a lot of things we were going to do anyway. Just like Michael said, you know, the phone is going to become even more important as a central controller of everything. Now it's how you get in the room. Pretty soon, it will be how you turn the TV on in the room, as opposed to using a remote control that somebody else touched, right? And so, you know, there's, um, there's, there's, a, there's a good side here that's happening, and that innovation is going to, you know, create further advancing, and, and we just have to continue to rest on the science and the scientists and, um, and, and move us in the right direction. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I've been somewhat amiss in my responsibility of asking Audrey if we had any questions that came in from our audience this afternoon. We have about five minutes left. Audrey, yeah. were there any questions? Yes, we've actually had a lot of good questions and we happened to cover some of them just in chatting. Um, one thing we've gotten a lot of questions on is a question for Michael probably. Um, I know you said at the beginning there's a lot of variation between states, but people have had a lot of questions on the current state of pools, gyms, and spas, and kind of what that looks like as things open up again in hotels. Same protocols that you're seeing opening up in the general public. Um, you know, pools have opened up, uh, very, very limited, um, li limited uh, occupancy <laughs> that, that we're going to allow. And you've seen that in many pools. So they're actually restricting the amount of people that can actually be in a pool deck and making sure, sure the chairs are um, at least uh, six feet apart uh, for anybody that's gonna be uh, celebrating or enjoying that, that type of environment. When I was in Mexico, as I just mentioned at our resort, along the beach, you saw doubles of all chairs with umbrellas and six feet in between each one. The explanation is very simple. If you're a single out there, you're going on a two bed area either way. Uh, because they're not going to move any of that around, but they, they have separated it. And then around the pool, you could see it was limited to 20 people uh, as far as being able to seat in that capacity. Um, same with gyms. Uh, what we've seen with a lot is um, two options. I've seen gyms that either are putting one, every other uh, product out of, uh, out of sequence or removing it completely. But in most cases, it's, it's you know, say you had five treadmills, you, or six treadmills, you would see you're only going to use two to three of those treadmills, period, uh, to make, depending on the distance. But you're trying to keep your six feet in between that as well. All the regulations are the same. And then you're seeing a ramped up staffing as far as cleaning behind anybody using everything. We used to trust people, you know, at a gym to wipe down. Well, now it's more than wiping down. It's wiping down and sanitizing at the same time. So uh, you're, you're seeing a little more staff dedicated to that as well. Yeah, th th thank you, Michael. So trust but verify, right? Uh, exactly. There you go. Uh, Audrey, one more question. I think we have about yeah. three minutes left. Uh, okay, yeah, we. this uh, is for Peter. We've had a few people ask for 
some guidance on how an organization or a hotel would receive the uh, well certification that you were discussing at the beginning. Okay, good. Um, so the well health safety rating is accessible to all building types and facilities uh, and uh, will begin taking registrations on July 20, uh, June 29th. So that's on Monday. Uh, there are guidelines. There's a set of criteria that needs to be met saying these are the docs that need to be submitted uh, in order to be reviewed, a third party review. Uh, and the designation can be, um, you know, accomplished. And if the documents are in good shape, it can be accomplished in, uh, in, in a matter of weeks, not months. Uh, but that's a process from the International Well Building Institute. Uh, wellcertified.com would have the information. Well health safety rating is what we're talking about. Uh, there is a bigger program called well certification, which is every wellness category and on-site performance verification and whatnot. But the health safety rating is specific to uh, pathogen response policies uh, and uh, that will be uh, uh, available for registrations and to receive designations starting on Monday of next week. Great. So uh, th th thank you, Peter. I I'm going to suggest, Audrey, that we mm -hmm. collect the hyperlinks for uh, all these resources. Uh, Michael had mentioned a program early uh, in this conversation. Uh, let's collect those and then put those on our website so anybody with an interest in getting access to additional resources uh, could certainly do that. So that's our commitment to anyone listening in at the moment. I think we're just about uh, out of time. I would like to first turn to Michael, then to Peter. In 30 seconds, is there anything else you would like the regulatory community, uh, the environmental health and safety community uh, to know? Any, any parting uh, uh, thoughts of wisdom? Uh, first to you, Michael. Um, you, you know what, nothing that we haven't covered. It's just a reminder that things are gonna remain really fluid. Um, and everything we've talked about is as, as of what we know right now. And uh, it will change uh, as we learn more about it. And then um, secondly, I'll leave with one thing that uh, to, to get us back to where we need to, everybody has a shared responsibility as we talked earlier. Uh, we, we all have to be thinking about this the same way if we're gonna be effective. Thank you, a good homogeneous approach. Uh, Peter? Yeah, I would say, you know, to a, to a regulatory audience, um, I'd make the following observation. Uh, you know, we've, we've been at this for, for, for about eight years right now, you know, scrubbing technology, creating standards and whatnot. Uh, and then literally overnight, uh, the types of claims that are out there uh, as it relates to products and solutions that, that have, you know, are saying effective against COVID, um, antimicrobial, antiviral, the, the consumers don't really know the difference between antimicrobial antiviral claims, right? Um, and the EPA draws some lines and distinctions, of course, and there's so many things that need to be uh, met in order to be able to put something on a label. But the stuff that we're seeing out there right now is reckless, um, and a lot of it is harmful, uh, and it's confusing. And, and so as it relates to new technologies, new solutions, or even some harmful claims being made by manufacturers that are pushing the envelope a little too much as it relates to what their product does and whether it's safe or not. You know, wall-mounted air purifiers that might do a decent job capturing fine particles down to maybe 0 0.008 microns, but by a process of, let's say, bipolar ionization or something else, they're kicking off ozone. <laughs> and right, that's not right. good, right? So, so, so th this is, we need the regulatory authorities now more than ever to make sure that claims are valid um, and that red flags are being thrown and that the public is educated uh, so that you know we don't end up doing more harm. Uh, there's ways to treat problems, but some of the ways to treat those problems create other problems. And, and, and it's up to the regulatory agencies to really make sure that nothing's bleeding into the environment, for example. Like that, that, that's, that's, that's a balance right now. And, and, uh, but, but I think it's a, it's a risky time uh, because when everybody's looking for solutions, uh, you've got manufacturers out there making some pretty hefty claims and some of them are uh, are, are really uh, against uh, every every guideline we know about. <laughs> uh, th 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 thank you, Peter. And I want you to know that we have an upcoming uh, webinar on cleaning solutions that will be co-hosted by the US EPA, uh, giving Good. recommendations on that. Uh, regretfully, I was a poor moderator. We're over time. Audrey, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to close us out. Great, thanks Dr. Dijak. Yeah, so we're at the end of our time. Um, I just wanna thank Michael and Peter again for being here. We know you're really busy with everything going on, so we appreciate your time. Thank you to our attendees also. Um, once again, I'll be sending out information on continuing education credits, um, but I'll also leave my contact information up on the slide for a minute if anyone needs it. Um, 
and keep an eye out for the next webinar in our live chat series and we hope you can join us again. So thanks again for joining us and we'll see you next time. Nice job, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.